John. Good afternoon. The, the Information Technology and Government Affairs Committee will now come to order. Thank you very much. And we have three items on the agenda for today's agenda, and we will begin with item number one. And item number one is a motion, Cardenas Labange Wiesar, relative to the status of lease agreements for the installation of telecommunications equipment on City of Los Angeles property, including potential revenue from such agreements and related matters. Thank you. Is anybody here from staff, various departments, city attorney's office, etc., you can make comments on this matter? Dan, Dan Cranbrink from the City Attorney's Office. John Chavez with the CAO. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. We, since the last time we were up here reporting to you, we've developed a working group with several departments involved in this working group, including DWP, CAO, GSD, ITA, to uh, start to work on a master lease and the parameters of that master lease. We've had internal meetings and, and an external meeting with a cell phone provider, uh, T-Mobile, to discuss potential areas uh, where we could work on a master lease together. And this working group is going to continue every other week, uh, both internally and externally, to kind of ferret out what issues we've had a meeting of the minds on and which issues we still need to work on. Okay. Now, this is not... Uh what you would call an RFP process. For example, this is not where a situation where the city has, say, we own a building, and on the first floor there's 10,000 square feet, and would like to lease that out. In that particular case, we would have to treat it more like a one occupancy situation. Therefore, we have to get uh, whoever offers us the most, whether it's consistent with the use of the building, et cetera, et cetera. In this particular case, we're talking about space that is does not preclude other uh, entities from actually occupying and or practicing that same endeavor on that particular property, correct? That is absolutely correct. We can negotiate with several providers. Exactly. And, and certainly I'm sure if policy-wise we determine that this is uh, something that we want to afford ourselves as a city, once we, once and if we do determine that, uh, I'm sure for the owners of the city, our constituents, it certainly would behoove us to hopefully be in a situation where we had multiple negotiations, multiple leases, which means more revenue for our constituents and for the city. Absolutely. So, so I just wanted to clarify that because somebody tuning in might think that we're, we've got some kind of exclusive or something like that with the first interested party, uh, third party that would like to um, um, participate in this kind of relationship. So I just want to make sure that people understand should, for example, T-Mobile and the City of Los Angeles be successful in making such an arrangement, it does not preclude any other entity from actually doing the same on that site or any other site, correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, is GSD here? Yes. Could you come forward, please? John Shepard, General Service Department, Asset Management Division. Excellent. Um, I'd like to ask you, what what is the, the status of, of the appraisal or evaluation system that we intend to utilize for these kinds of sites? We have just uh, recently contracted uh, with an appraisal service to uh, uh, to start. And uh, as I understand from a couple of days ago, they've already uh, started on a couple of uh, sites. Okay. Now, this particular uh, company that will be appraising the, the value of these opportunities, they specialize in this kind of evaluation? Yes, they do. They've uh, done several uh, similar types of uh, uh, communications projects in the past and have a, a pretty extensive record doing so. Okay. How did we come across them? I mean, what, what, what made us decide, you know what, these guys are the perfect ones for for this project? I think uh, Dave Roberts, um, our property manager who actually hired uh, the contractor, went through uh, several con uh, similar contractors and uh, chose the best uh, one based on the qualifications. 
which included uh, interest in uh, or experience in um, uh, communications. Sorry. Okay. So basically, this kind of appraisal is something that uh, we anticipate if everything goes well, uh, there'll be a, a lot of activity around these kinds of appraisals within the uh, within the city and on our our facilities, and therefore. This is something where we're going to have a long-term relationship depending on these kinds of appraisals with this organization? Uh, yes, it could. Uh, it, we may have a little bit too uh, too many sites for, for one uh, appraisal at this time, but uh, we wanted to get started, so we went with the best uh, uh, company that we possibly could. Okay. So we will have an opportunity to allow other organizations that specialize in this kind of work to participate as well, should we end up having a lot of interest in this? Yes, there, there would be a need, I think, sometime in the future. Okay. And once uh, some appraisals are done, say, for example, on the first few sites that seem to be identified, what, what are the next steps with GSD once you receive an appraisal on a particular site? Uh, well, we're going to uh, sit down with city attorney and uh, the, the working group and um, and assess based on the uh, comps and uh, the information that we get from the uh, appraiser, which w should include those comps, and uh, and and look at reality and and also look at the uh, proposals by T-Mobile and try to come up with a compromise. We're not quite sure how we're going to do that at this point, but our working group will probably. Uh, I think that we're competent enough to come up with a with a reasonable means to uh, to come up with a good price. Mm -hmm. Council Member, yes. if I may, um, one other path we're taking is we've done our own due diligence with public agencies who have had similar agreements. We've gotten comps from uh, other cities that are neighboring to us within the state and nationwide. Um, in addition, simply working with the other departments and with the Department of Water and Power, we've also acquired a lot of useful information for similar contracts of this nature. By merely by sharing information in this working group, it has helped all of us kind of understand what the market's like right now in addition to what the folks at GSD are doing. Okay. Now when it comes to the um, potential lease agreement that is going to seem a bit new to us uh, as a city, um, who's, who's charged with putting that lease agreement together, the terms of that agreement, the, the template for that agreement? The city attorney's office, and we're going to be working with DWP. They have a lot of experience with these types of lease agreements. They've done several of them on their property. So working together, we've gotten a lot of great information, and we're going to be working closely with them on developing a master lease agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what came about that, that all of you decided to put together a working group? I think it's wonderful to see that kind of collaboration and that that kind of uh, working group mentality because obviously there's a lot of moving parts here. We want to get it right. This is something that uh, we're going down a road that we haven't exactly traveled very often in the city. So how did that come about? How that came about is uh, exactly what you just said, Council Member. There's a lot of moving parts and we discovered that there are negotiations going on in different parts of the city with DWP, with us. It simply made sense to bring all the stakeholders within the city together to work in a unified way so we could get the maximum benefit for the city and the taxpayers. Okay. Um, is the CLA part of that working group so far? I'm not certain. I just don't recall. Anybody remember the CLA being part of that working group? I will make sure to invite them if they are not. Yes, you're reading my mind. <laughs> uh, Councilman, I don't think um, we've been invited um, to participate in any meetings so far with the city attorney's office. Okay. Well, I invite you now. Thank you. Um, I think it's really important for us to uh, appreciate and respect everybody's respective duties and responsibilities and what everybody brings to the table. But let's not forget that this is uh, an opportunity for us to exercise our authority on creating a new policy and a new revenue structure within the city. And at the end of the day, um, what that revenue structure is going to look like and how much of this we're going to be willing to participate as a city. Uh, that's all policy matters. And on top of that, uh, what categorical funds we're going to consider these funds should this revenue materialize 
is going to be a policy decision of the city council as well so we want to make sure that the c l a is present at these working groups i think now is a perfect opportunity for the c l a to to be a part of them and make sure that we have a very holistic and well rounded result out of all of these deliberations how long do you think you need to finish coming up with a recommendation and the template etc for the city council to consider we're still in the beginning stages of this council member as far as identifying all the key issues we are working very aggressively to come up with a meeting of the minds on all key terms of a master lease agreement we want to make sure we have done all the due diligence and we know the fair market value and we're getting the max amount of dollars so we're hoping in the next several months I say several months you know we're meeting regularly but every couple weeks to get something done where both the city and T-Mobile come to an agreement yeah well I appreciate it and I respect that there are a lot of moving parts yet at the same time this isn't a political backdrop this is just reality that we're faced with and we are at a very very bad place in the city when it comes to revenue and every month that we are not ready to move forward with this that's revenue lost potentially should this be something that we can actually move on and actually create so with that what I'm going to ask is that you continue meeting as a working group and that the CLA be part of this working group and that also that you you're ready to report back in 30 days hopefully we can expedite all of these moving parts and we can actually hear the city attorney's office GSD the CLA and everybody chiming in saying I think we're ready I think we've done it I think we've done it right within the next 30 days okay and again I respect the fact that there's a lot of moving parts this is there's a lot of newness to this and especially when we're dealing with legal matters it's really important for us to move appropriately and carefully but at the same time every month that goes by that's revenue that seems to be sitting there ready to be retrieved on behalf of our constituents and and we need to keep our mind and our eye on that as well so I'm gonna push you all to try to try to come back within 30 days and be ready for us to move forward understood all right any questions you mentioned T-Mobile a number of times how many cell phone companies are there in Los Angeles area several council member I have we reached out I don't know off the top of my head have we reached out to all of them I see the correspondence to T-Mobile but T-Mobile reached out to us we haven't done a solicitation to various cell phone companies for work I know other companies have reached out to various departments in the recent recently but so maybe we should as we proceed reach out to all the companies Verizon AT&T and I don't know how many there are but we should reach out to all of them and hopefully do this as a package where we can five ten how many there are do you know how many there are no Ted Jordan from the city attorney's office I don't know how many there are there are certainly several one of the key components of this is that with this lease agreement that we're talking about companies will have a ability to co-locate so the the need to negotiate a separate master lease agreement isn't necessarily the same once you have one in place that provides for co-location but there's their equipment do they want to share their equipment or there be multiple antennas for the different vendors I can't speak to technically how that happens it was my understanding is there would be the companies would have their own equipment the facilities would be set up to allow another company to come in and use that same space I presume with their own equipment yeah but I'm talking about the antennas that they have so we're talking if there's five companies five different antennas they don't share the same pole in other words you what I'm trying to see is how much revenue we can generate how we can accommodate if you're a Verizon or a T-Mobile or whatever you are if we could accommodate them all that's the better for everyone certainly but in the co-location scenario one of the topics of topics of negotiation would be the city's participation in any revenue generated by the master lessee when it turns around and then enters into an agreement for a co-location well that's what I'm saying we should be able to receive the revenues exactly instead of T-Mobile put it up then they charge the others for using that we should be able to charge them all and that's part of that's exactly what we're negotiating that's called a sublease I've already instructed in a previous meeting that 
that we be mindful of the fact that these are our properties and you're absolutely right they can put multiple users on one antenna everything will be to the city people are not going to be allowed to sublease their antennas on our sites people have to negotiate directly with the city on every single user otherwise you put this but they make the money really yeah you know you lease out a space for that's part of the negotiation so we appreciate you having said you lease out a space for two thousand dollars a month and all of a sudden on the back end they're getting a thousand dollars a month from five different users exactly exactly okay so I just want to make sure that we're covering that now does this include all municipal facilities or just certain municipal facilities would it include fire police general services facilities city halls city hall yeah all that GSD speaks satellite city halls lease property that we occupy for our city operations David Pascal Department of General Services uh, in looking at this proposal and looking at other proposals in the past, we have uh, generally um, decided that uh, police and fire facilities are off limits because of the sophisticated communications equipment they have on site and the problems with access for maintenance and also for the expansion. So uh, at least those facilities are probably not going to be identified uh, as potential sites for the installation of um, cellular uh, telephone equipment. Um, the other buildings uh, that are under the purview of the Department of General Services are the buildings that we're looking at. Uh, that means we're not looking at the proprietary departments right now in terms of their facilities. And uh, we're probably going to uh, have to uh, look at a few s uh, facilities in the Civic Center as well because of uh, you know, the presence of the uh, Los Angeles Police Department and the Los Angeles Fire Department as well. But we haven't gotten that far along. And what we have right now is a proposal from T-Mobile uh, that uh, calls for the rollout of so many uh, of a limited number of sites during that first year and in hiring the consultant that is developing the market rate study he is looking at those sites and what he is developing is basically a report that will tell the city of Los Angeles what we should charge on a monthly basis for the sites that are included in what I'll call phase one of T-Mobile's proposal and once we get that document back, that will probably fix the rate for the city of Los Angeles. We generally get a range of cost, okay? For instance, when we have them do appraisals to determine what we should charge to lease space in the mall, what we will get back generally is a proposal for a dollar and twenty-five cents a square foot up to a dollar and fifty cents a square foot. And what we've done, particularly with the mall merchants, is we start at the lower end of that range. But we need the professional input of a consultant to determine what we should charge T-Mobile and other cell phone providers for the use of our rooftops for the installation of this equipment. And those consultants deal with this on a daily basis? Yes. Uh, for instance, when we had to do an appraisal of uh, Cuenga Peak, we actually selected an appraiser who specializes in appraising open space land. And so in this case, what we did is we contacted three appraisers who have had some experience developing appraisals for communication sites, and we asked them each to submit a proposal, and we selected the one that we felt was most cost effective, and we selected the person that we thought had the most expertise in this area. So if we were to go to the commercial buildings around Los Angeles and find what they are leasing the space for, our rates should be competitive with those. Well, it's kind of interesting you would ask that. Uh, we have uh, uh, a prominent uh, commercial real estate firm that manages the public works building and also Fig Plaza, and they obviously manage buildings all over the world. So we've asked them to provide us with some information on what they charge, okay, on these privately owned commercial buildings in Southern California for the installation of cell phone equipment. Because obviously it convenience for the cell phone individual person who uses that and revenues for us right. to help our general fund. Absolutely. And the fund, those funds would go into the general fund? Um, I would think that that would be the proposal, but that's probably someone else's decision. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you very much, Council Member. Um, if I instruct the staff, we have a couple of... Uh, Comment cards. Thank you very much. Uh, Clark Harris and John Lee. John Q. Lee.
Mr. Chair, members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is Clark Harris. I'm the Senior Development Manager for T-Mobile. Um, we last spoke back on March 16th at the committee meeting, and at that time, uh, the council had directed the department staff to move forward and develop a master lease agreement and an economic analysis on the potential rent revenue that could be generated for the city. Subsequent to that, uh, as you just heard, the city attorney's office reached out to us, and we met with them on the April 13th. Uh, to move forward on the master lease agreement. In that meeting, the city attorney's office presented an agenda with discussion topics, uh, which prudentially were, were essentially the, the terms and conditions, uh, the business terms and conditions um, as to what the master lease agreement would move forward with. And, and in that meeting, we articulated our responses uh, and our position to that. Um, point I want to make is, is based on that is, is from that meeting and the proceedings moving forward, the, those terms that were proposed were things that we could not live with and were basically non-starters for us. And we wanted to communicate that to you uh, because I believe where we've come uh, in our relationship, we've been very open, the council's been very open to us and we appreciate that and we wanted to reply back and be very open to you and to where our position is. Uh, what we'd like to submit to you is the discussion points uh, that were part of the agenda and our responses so you understand where we're coming from. I can go through those in detail if you wish. You could submit them for the record. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask is it's my understanding that the city charter allows for city council and not the city attorney's office to be the approving agency of a master lease agreement. And if that's true, I wanted to share the following, and that is the T-Mobile wants to move forward and be a partner with the continue. city. Continue. Yeah, Go ahead. Continue. Two we want to move forward and be a partner with the city. And we have taken this seriously because over the last two years, we've been committing resources and time to make this happen. Um, you, you asked, or was asked, uh, I think in our last meeting, as to why this had been uh, approved, this program had been approved in 2003 and none of the wireless carriers had moved forward with it. And I think um, I just answered that question. Can you enumerate those issues? I'm sorry, sir? Can you list those issues, the non-starters? Yes, I may. You don't have to go through all of them if they're many. No, I'll, I'll be happy Get some to. some prime examples. I'm yeah, the, figure, I don't know where they are. No, that's okay. Uh, Currently, the uh, T-Mobile has a lawsuit with the city regarding land use entitlement issues. Uh, the city attorney's office wished for us to uh, dismiss that lawsuit to move forward. Um, it doesn't deal with this, though. It's that is record. correct. This is a real estate issue that we're concerned here okay. with. They're just separate, separate conversations, separate issues. Okay. Second, uh, they were looking at um, the revenue that each site would bring in and basing rent on that. That is something that we will not move forward with. Well, how, what do you mean move, won't move forward with? Uh, they were asking for us to, to share our financial, how much we would generate in revenue of use. Uh, one, that's something that is very, very cumbersome and not necessarily accurate for us to generate. As you're aware of, there's a lot of different plans that families or individuals can get, so it becomes very convoluted. And in order for us to share and ensure that the city feels comfortable the information we are providing is accurate, that opens up our whole books. Well, let me ask you this question. Do you have similar agreements with various private owners of sites where you have these kinds of facilities? No, sir. No, you don't understand my question. Do you have any other sites where you rent so you can have your your antennas? Oh, my, yes, that is yes. correct. We do. Sorry, I misunderstood. On a, and on on those other sites, are you required to extrapolate that information no. and give it to the leaseor? Yeah, this particular business arrangement is not done in the industry. I've never that, heard of that, it. That's my point. Yeah. So basically, that's what you're saying. You're not saying that you don't want to cooperate with information. You're that's not saying correct. that you don't want to have a relationship of cooperation and understanding and be able to sign a lease agreement with the city. You would like to do that. That is correct. But when you're asked to divest of information or give information as part of the agreement that is not in any way an industry standard in any way whatsoever, that's where you find a, have a hard time uh, being able to agree to that. That right? is correct. Okay. Thank you, you just want to pay 
rate and that's it. This is a real estate transaction, transaction and that's predominantly traditional lease. I'm leasing space. We right. pay a flat negotiated rent up right. front. Okay. That leads to another, they had a most favored nations clause uh, they were requesting, which would, um, I had to educate myself on it before we, we attended the meeting, but long story short, it basically allows that as, as terms that we say negotiate with another city uh, and the city of Los Angeles finds that those terms are, are more favorable, then that automatically becomes applicable to this city. And I think you understand uh, from a business point of view, that's not something we're entering into. And again, to your point, that is not standard business practice and we've not entered into those types of agreements ever in the past. Um, so those are some examples. Yes, and I think that. But actually, what you just pointed out is those are are issues that are supposed to be negotiated into an agreement, but actually agreed to by the policy body, such as the city council, and we would decide up or down whether or not we agree that that lease is in favor, that we favor that a potential lease agreement, and that we would consider it to go forward. That is my understanding on the process. Which is different than looking at technical legal uh, matters within a contract, whether or not it is legal or not to enter into a contract, which that, that is more the purview of the city attorney's office, the way I understand my responsibilities and I understand the charter. So I appreciate you bringing that to our attention, and I can understand and I can see how nervous you are. I've talked to you before, and this is probably the most nervous I've ever seen you. Uh, it's unfortunate that you find yourself in that position. But like you, uh, like I said, you wanted to point out some things. You have done so. You, you offered to su submit it for the record. I'd like to continue to move on, Mr. Zang. Do you mind? Well, I'm, I'm just issue, I have an issue with this land issue. There's a lawsuit regarding a land issue with T-Mobile. That is correct. And that's part of the agreement that would be somehow resolved before going into this agreement. That was the interpretation that was presented to us. Okay. But they are separate issues. Yeah, they are separate issues, but they're completely separate them. issues. Correct. Yeah, via the city attorney's office, that would be correct okay. because they're dealing right. with both sides. I just wanted to get a, a glimpse of some of the issues that. Uh, Thank you. Obviously, we're not going to go into detail on that, obviously. Right. Just wanted to get the. And I can't. Capsule view. Yeah. Well, exactly. he's jumped to his feet to have a <laughs> debate, but we're not going to do that today. Okay. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Lee, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, I'm fine. Thank you. You look pretty nervous, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much gentlemen. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. So with that, um, we'll instruct GSD, CAO, CLA, and the city attorney's office, uh, and request, excuse me, the city attorney's office to report back in 30 days with another status update, and hopefully we will be able to to have that lease agreement, uh, the master lease agreement, um, ready to be to move forward with at least the template, and on the first potentially the first sites. And also, what I'd like to do is instruct the CLA and the CAO to be the conveners of the working group meetings from here on out until we resolve this matter. Mr. Trichelson, City Attorney's Office. Sure, you're welcome. David, Mike, David Michelson with the Office of the City Attorney. Thank you for allowing me to spend just a couple minutes with you, and I'll make it brief. Um, obviously, it's not our intention to try to negotiate this here in, in open and public. It's our job as, as the City Attorney's Office, along with the departments and the council that we represent, to put together various options in the best package possible to give the policymakers uh, the best opportunity to make an informed decision as to whether you think this is an appropriate, reasonable proposal master lease for the city. So we push and we pull. That's our job. That's the department's job. They have negotiators who join us at that negotiating table. But just a quick highlight, for instance, the most favored nation, very common provision you find in agreements with municipalities all over the country, quite frankly. And I think you could probably appreciate and understand why. If the city of San Diego, three months after this, this city of Los Angeles does a deal with T-Mobile, the city of San Diego does a, a deal three months later with T-Mobile, and they're the deal is better than what we got here in the city of L.A., you're not going to be happy with us. You're going to say, well, why couldn't you get the same deal? That's why Most Favored Nation Clause is appropriate and perfectly reasonable to make sure that similarly situated municipalities, um, if they get a better deal, that vendor is going to step up and give us that deal as well. It's an, it's, an, it's an effort to level the playing field. We are one of the bigger agencies in the country. And the other issue I've mentioned in response to making sure the city gets the most um, appropriate rent possible 
while we did ask, and I think it perfectly was appropriate to ask, T-Mobile, we challenged T-Mobile. We said, T-Mobile, how do you do this around the country? How do other cell providers do this around the country in terms of determining rent? Is it always $4,000 a month per site? Or is there other mechanisms that are out there technically feasible, such as how much traffic, how much revenue is coming through a sales site? Uh, if you can monetize that, why can't the city of LA get a percentage of that? Even if you've done it none, nowhere else in the country, which is what we found out, if it's still technically doable, just because no one else has done it, tell us why you cannot do that with us if it's to the financial benefit of the city while still presenting a fair deal to T-Mobile. That's what negotiations are about. We've only had the one meeting with them. So we're not trying to say we're a big, bad, and a bully. We're just trying to say, here are terms that we want to talk about. We want to be aggressive. We want to bring as much money into the city collectively as possible. And bottom line, when it comes to you all, as the policymakers, we want to make sure that we collectively in the departments and the city attorney have done our job in presenting the most you know, financially appropriate and beneficial package to, to the city. So that's what we're up to. And we'll try to do it quickly because time is, time is money. It, yes, it, it, it very much so is. You know what, you should be a, a council member because all of the things that you just talked about are the kinds of things that are policy matters right. and also city attorney matters. However, when it comes to negotiating the lease, that in the way this city's run, it's my understanding that GSD would be more involved with those kinds of questions and those kinds of push and pull, as you described, than the city attorney would. It's one, what's one thing for the city attorney to tell GSD, you know what, why don't you ask them these questions? Why don't you go ahead and explore these ideas? Maybe we are pushing the envelope as a city, but maybe we're big and bad enough, the second largest city in the country, we can get them to the best of that information so that we can have a better understanding and strike the best deal possible for the city, et cetera. But at the same time, it's my understanding that that was not the case, that the city attorney's office, the city attorneys, that you guys took the lead in asking those kinds of questions in which were you were not acting as though you were not acting so much as the city attorney, you were acting as the negotiator, uh, which in this particular case, we have another entity in the city, such as General Services Department, that actually would take that lead. So, and that's one of the reasons why from here on out, I want the CLA and the CAO to uh, be the leads on convening these uh, working group meetings because that, with all the respect, although those are smart things to do and they're pretty cool and nifty and all the above and innovative and all those kinds of things, that's the, the information you should be sharing with your client and then your client should be telling, you know what, go for it. We want you to ask those questions. We want you to go ahead and be that aggressive. We want you to go ahead and get those things. You know the favored nation clause? That's something we could do in our first agreement. Perhaps it is. But at the same time, the last thing I want to do as a policymaker and a former real estate broker and somebody who's actually owned real estate and negotiated these things for the benefit of my own family, in this case I'm doing it for the benefit of the people of Los Angeles. I'm not going to chase away business by creating a custom and practice that doesn't exist and then maybe waiting another two, three, four years by the time the industry comes back around and says, okay, we will go ahead and agree to favored nation clauses on these kinds of rents, on these kinds of agreements. Look at all the revenue we've lost. As it is, as policymakers, not the city attorney's office, as policymakers, we have not taken advantage of this opportunity, even though it's been bounced around in the policy circles for years and years and years now. Look at all the revenue we've lost already. That's not on the city attorney. I'm putting it on ourselves, the city council. So that's why I want to see this happen in the next 30 days. And if it can't happen in the next 30 days, whoever can't, bring it together, whether it's the city attorney's office or the GSD or whoever else, if we can come to grips with this in the next 30 days and create that master agreement and move on, then you're going to tell us in open public why we have, been, have not been able to arrive at that. But we've waited too long. And when I say we, it's on us for the last few years. Now you're participating, and we want to get this done as quickly as possible. No, I appreciate that, Council Member. Uh, just to be clear, the City Attorney's Office was brought in just in the last few months um, after this has been rattling around for a while. And on technology deals, and this is a technology deal, it's not your typical lease, mm -hmm. on technology deals, it's very common for municipalities to have their lawyers intimately involved in the negotiations. We don't do it in isolation. Every meeting we've had, both internal and external, we've had GSD with us, we've had CAO with us, we're happy to have the CLA with us. It's a big, long bench. For instance, in the county of Los Angeles, up the street, all their technology deals are negotiated by lawyers. Typically, they actually hire outside counsel, which is very expensive. We've got expertise inside our office. Are you suggesting we hire outside counsel Absolutely for a technical not. deal? We've got expertise. <laughs> We've got expertise to handle this. Ted I Jordan's think, a patent I, lawyer. I think that goes against got, the grain of what Mr. Janich ran on. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's why we have the benefit of having lawyers in our office who've got that kind of technical expertise. 
uh, while we are helping to drive the bus, our hands are on that steering wheel. So are GSDs and CAO and uh, elsewhere. And we're going to move as quickly as we can. But we are nifty and we are crafty and we are aggressive where we believe appropriate. And I appreciate you saying those things. We are not looking to slow things down. But we are looking to make sure that the best package possible is brought to you. Absolutely. We'll crack the champagne together when we finally do this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. All right. Any more questions from the committee? Uh, now we've beaten that one up. And uh, anybody else from the public would like to speak? Nervous or not? Okay. Seeing none. Seeing none. Uh, public comment is now closed on item number one. So with that, uh, those are the instructions from this uh, committee. We'll move on to item number two. And item number two is a report from the city administrative officer relative to action by the Google Implementation Working Group to expand the number of participants and the duration of the Google email and collaboration system pilot. Good afternoon, Patty Huber with the uh, CAO's office. We're uh, chairing the working group. A little closer to the mic. Thank you. My apologies. We are chairing the working group along with the um, CLA and uh, ITA and CD6 um, and the mayor's office. Um, and we've invited all the participation of the pilot departments to provide their input as well. Um, before you is a status report on the implementation. The initial pilot um, group was um, done in February, and as a result of that pilot, three main areas of concern were identified um, with issues of performance being the number one concern, as well as um, then followed by functionality, as well as the ongoing issues of ensuring that the LAPD security um, issues were addressed. Um, in March, as a result of the findings of the pilot group and the issues, particularly as relating to performance, um, were identified and in conjunction with ITA's recommendation, um, the pilot group or the working group extended the pilot period and expanded the number of users so we could more fully assess the system and ensure we are, were addressing um, the performance issues in particular. Um, since then, ITA did determine and has implemented a resolution to the performance issues, and those have been resolved. Um, the functionality issues identified by the pilot departments, both the initial group and the expanded group, were prioritized and submitted to Google. Um, and we received on Friday their preliminary response on that. Um, for LAPD, the security issues and resolution of that is ongoing, and we are on track to continue moving forward with their pilot groups. Um, in the near future. And then um, I, I would just note with the expanded pilot, there is, you know, it did extend the implementation period out and we may run up against the June 30th wall, although we're all committed to and trying to get everybody com um, transitioned before then so that we can um, avoid any unintended or unbudgeted expenses for group wise next fiscal year. And we're here to answer your questions. Okay. Now, on any system like this that's being used by 10, 20, 30,000 individual users, there certainly is a natural reluctance to, uh, I don't want to go first, uh, let everybody else try it before I do, all kinds of, of resistance to this, these changes and this implementation. How has that been coming along when it comes to the pilot program and people welcoming it and also being uh, more than or, or willing to actually participate fully and, and accept it. You don't have to name names, but give me a feeling for what we're dealing with. Randy Levin, ITA. I think it's been overall positive. Um, I think we've learned things through the pilot, you know, and particularly in the area of training, and we've expanded our training with the help of CSC and Google. They've brought more trainers to bear, and we've done either individual training where we go out to people's desktops or classroom training or anything in between. So I think that that's assisted. Um, but overall, I would say that the opinion of the majority of the users is positive, and um, you know, it's just managing through change. People don't like to change, so whatever we can do to um, ensure that they know how to use the system and migrate through it is, is what we're doing. When it comes to um, Google's 
consideration of, of certain types of features that perhaps weren't afforded on the first day and that hopefully we'll be see we'll see included as as the uh, as the process goes on what are some of the features that we're expecting or hoping that Google will actually add there there are um, there's a list of features that we had provided to Google I can tell you that 34 of those were delivered um, there are two or three items that the city prioritized as high that after talking to them today they're in development so they're working on them and um, I, I think that what we need to do is continue this process of prioritizing and giving this to them and then getting it back but I don't want to look past the fact also that they've delivered 34 enhancements you know since we started this are, are there any features that we've asked of Google that they have finally answered us and said, I'm really sorry, but we can't provide that feature or uh, we don't see the day that we're going to be able to provide it. In other words, they're just saying, no, we're not going to. Well, we, we thought that about you know, potentially about a couple of the items that were high, but after talking with them today, they're, you know, they're in development. But I, you know what I will say is that not every enhancement that's requested by the city will be implemented, nor will every enhancement be implemented the exact way it was done in the old system. Google's committed to delivering enhancements and I think has been very good about it. It may not be in the exact way, shape, or form that we're used to seeing it in the old system. And so we need to make sure also that we're adapting to however we meet the requirement with, with the new tool. And, and I would clarify, um, there were in the initial response from Google, there were uh, several high priority items that um, Google indicated were not in their process at this time. Randy did talk to them today, and they are going to move them into their development phase I'm, based on her response. I just would clarify that they're putting them in development does not guarantee that they will ultimately be in the system because they'll have to, in that development process, determine whether it's even feasible for them to deliver. Mm -hmm. So we would not know today if they could deliver those features. Or as, as I mentioned too, they may come up with another idea yeah. or opportunity, a different way of delivering that okay. functionality. Correct. Okay. And those discussions are ongoing? Those Correct. Yes. When it comes to the read receipt function, um, where is Google on that function? That one is currently in development. Okay, but that's not good enough for me. Currently in development could mean that, you know, I have a 12-year-old and by the time she's 30, it could still be in development. Um, that's a very generic, I mean, we had some lawyers in the room, I'm sure we still have some, but uh, I'm sure a lawyer wouldn't encourage their client to go ahead and bank on that becoming a reality. What are we doing to make sure that uh, the read receipt function because that the read receipt function was something that was discussed with me and somebody very high up in Google actually said that's something that we can do and that's something that we're going to put into development and that's something that we're going to come to deliver someday. Now it comes time for us to start to get a better understanding. Is that someday 2010, 2011, 2030? No, I believe it will become somewhere in 2010. Okay. I just don't know what that's going to look like. Then that's fine, but I, I still want, I'm charging you, your department, Randy, not you personally, you can de delegate anybody you want, to get something in writing from Google, or at least something in writing, even if it doesn't give us a hard date, something that actually gives us a schedule that we can look to and then keep them accountable on. Okay. 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 When it comes to the some of the issues that we had uh, that were brought up, uh, as issues that seem to have been overcome by Google when it comes to security matters. And for example, when it comes to the kinds of things that police departments and fire departments worry about, where, what, what's the status of that and how did Google satisfy that? Um, we've been working very closely, uh, CSC, Google, ourselves and the LAPD on the various security um, issues and concerns. There were diagrams that were requested and descriptions requested from our last security meeting and, and those diagrams and documents are, some of them are complete, some of them are almost complete, but the understanding is there of how the security works. 
So um, I think that we're we're on track. We we demoed the e-subpoena functionality today, and I think that that's going to be acceptable. Maggie's here somewhere behind me, um, but I think that's going to be acceptable to the LAPD um, for the e-subpoena functionality. Um, and those, you know, were really at this point the primary primary sets of concerns. On that note. Anything you'd like to add? Oh, she's right Good here. afternoon, Maggie Goodrich, LAPD. Yes, we uh, saw the demo of the e-subpoena system um, this morning, and it, it seems to satisfy the requirements. So we'll uh, start testing that right away and um, do an assessment to make sure everything's working fine. But as we saw it this morning, that's looking OK. Um, as far as security is concerned, I asked for some documentation because we need to make sure we have proper documentation on hand should DOJ come audit our security um, as it pertains to how we uh, access law enforcement sensitive data. Um, the documentation that I received had some gaps in it, so I gave that back to um, Randy and to, to Google um, this morning to, to complete. So at this time, you don't see any problems, but there's certainly information that needs to be tightened up as far as like you said, those gaps. Right. So you need answer. You need answers to fill those gaps. Correct? correct. Okay, but nothing alarming. Nothing that worries you. Nothing that makes you say, "Wait a minute, this is this is not what we expected." As long as it, it works as they've said it's going to work, we should be we should be okay. Okay. Questions? Yes. Where's Google located? The headquarters. Um. I like not Santa Clara. What's the actual city? California? Mountain View, California, near Santa Clara. Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley. Some people call it. And reading in here, if we delay it, it's going to cost us 580000 possibly $945,000 if we delay the implementation, which obviously we don't have funds to pay our bills, leave alone, delay, and incur additional costs. So how are we going to avoid this delay and get everything done and when it comes to development, if development is not done within that time frame and we wait and they're still developing, are we paying a penalty because they haven't developed what they promised to develop if they could make it happen? First of all, we have a detailed schedule week by week with users and departments to get us to the end goal. Um, you know, at this point, particularly the groups that go in June are pretty full. So I'd say that the schedule is pretty fixed. We don't have a lot of room to move departments around anymore. So if we stick to the schedule, we're going to be fine. In terms of development, um, whatever needed to be developed is developed. So at this point, it's just a question of rolling out the system. Um, enhancements are going. They come every two weeks through Google, so they're just delivered as part of the as, as part of the the service actually that we get. So that's going to be ongoing, and it'll be ongoing for the rest of the time that we actually utilize the system. So I think if we can stick to the schedule and we can you know ensure that the departments don't want to move around too much at this point, we will make it by the end of June. What you, what, what is that cost increase that? Council Member Zine pointed to, what does it represent? What it, how represents that keeping the group-wise system up and available for... So it really, the, the, that figure comes with, instead of getting rid of the old system or phasing it out at the, at the pace or the speed that we had hoped, what it means is the slower rollout into the new system means that we have to still maintain the older system, and those are costs related to the older system? Those are the license costs that we would have to pay for any departments that don't transition by June 30th, because then we would potentially have to pay the annual license fee to GroupWise to keep GroupWise until we could finish the transition to Google, which those are, are rough estimates of cost, because that all comes down to whether or not we've rolled over and how many departments may or may not be on Google as of June 30th, and then when their annual reno renewal of the GroupWise license would be due. And then will there be, addition, will there be additional penalties or cost with, for the Google delay on the other side of the fence? There's, there's cost if we don't go forward and finish group-wise, but are there additional costs if there's a delay on Google? There could potentially be a cost there. Okay. And you mentioned the list of 34 items delivered. How many items are on the list if they've delivered 34? About 60, about 60. So there's half the items haven't been delivered. 
Well, some of them are low priority. Um, I mean, and I but think we need to, again, we're, we're, you know, we focus a lot in the city on a, on a, this is how it worked in the old system versus how it worked in the new, you know, in the new system rather than there are functionality that we're getting in the new system that wasn't even in the old system. So I think that we need to, um, I'm not trying to diminish the functionality we had in the old system, but I think we don't do any justice to the new stuff that we've been getting either. Well, I understand that. My whole issue is the cost. And if they're in development and half of them have been delivered, and whether it's a large issue or a small issue for the others and the other departments that aren't online yet, if we delay that and we uh, suffer additional costs, that's another issue. Well, I think the question is, is there anything on this list that would prevent us from going live? You know, and, and I would say to you, no, that there isn't anything on this list that would prevent us from going live. You know, can people send and receive emails? Yes, they can. Can they archive? Can they do calendar? Can they do the functionality, the basic functionality? Can the e-subpoena work? Um, I mean, I think those are the questions. Does the system perform? And I think when you look at, when you take a step back and you look at all of that, you say, yeah, we, we are ready to go live. It doesn't warrant a cost increase of 500000 to a $1 million to wait for these individual functions. I mean, the cost benefit is just not there. So um, knowing that Google is working on a lot of these items, and then there's a lot more that they're working on that we haven't even put down on the paper here, um, and the fact that we are in such severe financial distress, it would be, it would be hard to justify, you know, to cost justify that um, based on the, you know, the, the, the enhancements that we've requested. No, I understand that. And, yeah. and I'm, when I get my email, that it goes, it seems it's getting bounced from Google, or bounced from group-wise, group group yes. getting bounced over. Mm -hmm. Why can't we get it direct? Well, once everybody's on, when everything will be direct. Yeah. Yes, and, so, and that's something that was requested as part of the pilot was to run the two systems parallel so that we could, if need be, go back to group-wise. But it has created some inherent problems for ITA and some instability in the system overall. So we're currently running struggling with. We're currently running two systems with, yes, our, with our obsolete group-wise and then with this Google system. Right. Right, and we've asked users not to use the old system once they've been cut over. However, some do continue to use it, and it causes some synchronization problems. Sometimes can bring the post office down for that particular area. Well, so, is there a way we could take that out of their computer so they don't have that access to that group-wise? Because I know if I go to my computer, group-wise is still there. If I punch that, a better it's question up. is yes. on that note, Mr. Zein, who wants to do that? Who wants to take responsibility for cutting people off from their old habits? Any raising of hands? I don't think so. Well, the fact is people are doing it. And if it's messing but up the system, how do we, we pull that We've out? requested the working group to look at this item because it's causing us a lot of technical problems in the background. So, so the if there's a way to remove that particular item from the system, you know, it, internal it's one thing, but when a user punches that, Group-wise, there's somewhat. There's got to be some way we can disconnect that. There is. But, well, then we should do that. We, we as policymakers, we could instruct. We could instruct right. them that when make that part of the the pilot and then the phase in that every time somebody gets phased in that we cut them off from the old system. As as policymakers, we could instruct. But if we were to do that, and I'm not saying we should or shouldn't, if we were to do that, then we would have to be ready, willing, and able to, uh, you know, hold back, uh, you know, everybody when they want to tar and feather ITA or whoever it is that they want to blame because they don't want to let go of their banky, uh, you know, their comfort blanket, um, because that's one of the biggest problems whenever you change anything is that people are so used to the old system and they do not want to let it go. And, and the thing that I've never been willing to, to give to ITA is that mandate that they be that strict because then they get attacked and then people just see them being attacked, and all of a sudden people want to just, you know, tar and feather them. They don't even realize that they're being attacked for something that they didn't cause. It's just other people's insecurities, people's so, unwillingness to change. So how do we then unplug that from the users? It couldn't be that difficult. 
No, technically, we can do it. So why don't we just do it? Everyone who's online with Google, we should disconnect that aspect to save the system. I mean, they've got to convert. And if they haven't converted and keep on relying on the old system, it's creating problems. You want to... If, if, he's re, if the council member is requesting that, would you like some time to report back and to explain to us how the cause and effect would be for Kevin us to do that? Kevin can explain it right now. You can explain it right now? Okay. I'm Kevin Crawford, ITA. Um, for the system to turn it off, there's an automated function that we would run through GroupWise that would look for the accounts that have been migrated and immediately turn them off. Okay. So it would take us about um, 30 minutes to two hours, depending on how slow the system runs on the GroupWise system. Um, the problem that this would create and what we were asked for to run them in parallel is, is we couldn't flip a switch and say, okay, everybody's back on GroupWise because everything delivered directly to Google or in between Google would not be in the GroupWise system would have to be migrated back if we went back. Well, I mean, the, the Google's either going to work or it's not going to work. I mean, it's nice having a backup, but, you know, you, you've got your main operation, which is the Google system, and by continuing with the group-wise, if it's creating problems on the function of the system, I think logical, we just say you're converted over, you've been trained. Well, now this is, if Google crashes, then Google crashes. We've had crashes before. Right. I mean, and ITA is, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, as we were implementing a new system, we did have to have that backup in place because you just need to know that you have a, an email system. We've just reached really a decision point on whether or not we believe that the pilot has been su sufficiently successful that we are now going to move forward. Um, I would think that probably LAPD would want to run the two parallel because they're just entering into their pilot phase in, in the upcoming. How long have we been online with the other city entities other than the police department? The first January. staff went in on the 18th of January. Okay, so we've been since January. Has it crashed since January? The Google system? Yes. No, sir. So it reminds me of an airplane. You got the runway. You go on that runway for so long, and you're either going to take off right. or you're going to shut down. Well, we've taken off, sort of. We need to take off and launch and say we shut it down. I mean, it's it's proven itself. And if we if we if the police department needs it until they convert over, I can understand that. But you've got all these other employees that are creating problems with the system because they're going back into group-wise, which they shouldn't be doing. So why don't we just send a memo out that as of this date, if you've been trained on Google, the group-wise is going to be discontinued. It seems pretty simple and to save problems for everybody. Is there any, is there any technical reason why we couldn't or shouldn't do that based on what the councilman just said? No, and since we're on two different group-wise environments, you know. <laughs> It'll make your life easier, Andy. Right, and we can leave the one up for LAPD through the pilot so the okay to you turn might. that off. So I think it's logical and common sense to do that. If, if the sure. system had crashed a number of times, I would say, okay, let's keep this. But it hasn't crashed, and it's got a reliable reputation. You know, we launch it and go from there. So do we need to make a motion? Do we, how do we do this? We can amend the recommendation by instructing by X date that the people who are on the Google system uh, that they be switched off, or we can, uh, if, if ITA wants to recommend, you know, that everybody be switched off within two hours or two days or two weeks from them going on Google, and then to, it'll be an automatic switching from here on out. We have a full staff in this weekend to migrate 3,700 um, more people into the system, and we can do the same. We can turn off the Google system at the same time. How, how many do we have? The system at the same time. How many employees on the system now on Google? 3,400. 30, 3,400? 30, so we have a ways to go, but so 3,400 will take the load off of that right. particular aspect. So why don't we just do that, the directive of this committee? Okay. Okay. You feel comfortable with that? Yes, sir. Now, do we have other cities using Google as we've used GroupWise? Do we have other cities that have been happy with the system? The city of Orlando is in the process of implementing it now, and they appear to be very happy with it. No, people who already have it. Are we the first of municipal government? Wasn't Washington, D.C., they were the first mm -hmm. ones to have a handful of people right. on it? Right. Um, so they did not implement it citywide, though. They, but the, there, there are, are, are large entities out there. Google can come up and help answer the question. There are large entities out there that are non-government that actually are, are dependent on this Google system, right? Yeah, my name is Alex Dyker. I'm with Google. Um, uh, city of Orlando is in full production. 
parts of Washington, D.C. and a large number of corporate entities. So give me an example of a number of users in a large entity that is actually utilizing the Google system. Ten to 35,000. 35,000 with one entity? One entity, yes. Who is that? Vallejo, automotive parts manufacturer. Vallejo, didn't they go bankrupt? No, not the city of Vallejo. Private corporation. Genentech, 15 or so thousand. 15,000. And EP Plastics, about 12,000. And the airlines? KLM, 11,000. Motorola, thank you, 17,000. So they're all on board. And it's all working. They don't have a backup. There are over a million large corporate users, so employees from large companies. But they don't have a backup. They've got that system and that's it. They rely on Google and that's all. So I'd say I feel comfortable with it. It's not like it's a new operation. It's been around. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. While you're up here, it's too late now. Can you explain to us the government cloud, or GovCloud as you're calling it? Yes. So GovCloud is a portion of our infrastructure that is dedicated to government agencies, U.S. government agencies, and segmented from the rest of our infrastructure. So it exists only within the United States, and it's a separate set of servers that don't host any other data other than U.S. government data. So it's federal, state, and local. And the cause of that, or that's an answer to some of the issues that government has when it comes to that information and the proprietary nature and or not allowing that information to get access. So it's a security matter. The GovCloud is an answer to the security issues. Yes. Segmented, separated, caged off with only authorized, named authorized people who have access to maintain those systems. Named authorized from Google? From Google, but we'll be going through LAPD background checks. We've also required that those people that can actually put that data back together within the GovCloud be backgrounded through the department. So the employees of Google would have a background check that are on this system. Otherwise known as clearance. Correct. Right, they have a certain amount of clearance, right? Right. Do you have clearance on folks you just normally hire? All of our employees go through a background check. It just depends on what level of background check, depending on what kind of employee they are and what they're going to be doing. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Any departments want to report to this committee on your experience with the Google system? Anybody here comment on that as users? Yeah, okay, come on up. Bob Gillette, Director of Systems, Bureau of Engineering. Okay. So for the last, in February, we took a pilot group of our systems division and went on to Google with all of our systems people. We've been using it since February. We also are prepared to go Monday, May 10th, with the rest of the Bureau of Engineering. We've trained every single person in the Bureau of Engineering at least three to four hours with Google training that we've provided. We've also benchmarked all the browsers to make sure that they would work and which one has the best performance. We've been doing a lot of testing as far as performance from our remote sites as well. We've also been sending out, we came up with what we call a playbook, which is instructions on how each person is supposed to go there. In fact, we've been sending out e-mails this week explaining a countdown. We're going in seven days. This is what you need to do. You have to have a checklist that you've got to get signed off and sent in to your manager. We're going to be actually deployed in every single remote site in the Bureau of Engineering on Monday to answer questions. I get to go to a public counter in the harbor area to support them personally, but everybody in our systems division is going to be there, and we're ready to go. It's not a showstopper. But the thing is, you're giving me the impression that BOE is looking forward to this transition. We are. I mean, I don't mean to sound negative, but I thought that if somebody stepped up, they were going to probably have woes and concerns and stuff like that. Can you give us any woes or concerns? There are going to be growing pains with any new technology refresh. 
we expect that. Uh, but there are some lessons learned. Uh, let me give you two lessons learned. One is I spend 15% less now time doing email than I did when I started with the Google system. I've set up a lot of filters and labels, and now I don't have to categorize all that stuff and, and move it around, and I had to spend time archiving stuff, and I don't have to do that as well. So you, are you finding that the system that you are using now, the Google system, uh, we're not going back to the dark ages or what have you. It, it has plenty of features to accommodate a professional such as yourself or what have you on your day-to-day -day use at, you know, at work. Uh, yes, it does. Is there features I would like? Yes, there's features I would like. Um, there are some things that the second thing that, I'll, that we've learned in the Bureau of Engineering is there's a product that comes with it called Google Sites. And what we've decided is to take our intranet and move it to Google Sites and let divisions handle the implementation of updating their own stuff. That will get us out of the, you know, out of a lot of maintenance for systems. People can upload their own stuff. But we'll have a policy within our bureau on how to do that and instructions. But it's a plus. Okay. So just just for clarification, for those people hearing, uh, you were not put up to, to say these things by Google, correct? I'm not being paid by Google, and I'm not being paid by ITA. Because it seemed like the Google folks are getting a little giddy when on that last on that last comment. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Nothing else. Okay, and and also it's not fair that you know BOE, as an engineer myself, they tend to be considered to be kind of nerdy and kind of. We are nerdy and stuff, and we actually we provide our playbooks, and we've had other divisions and departments come into our training to see what we're doing. So we're happy to share that information with other departments. With any departments? Any departments. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you for your support and your welcoming of the system. Yes. Dennis Blumhoff. I'm the Director of Systems for the Fire Department. Uh, we participated in the selection of the vendor Google, in this case in CSC, and we also participated in the pilot. My division has been involved in the pilot for a couple of months now, and we're ready to roll out to the Fire Prevention Bureau, our personnel services, and also arson on May 17th. Uh, we'll then roll out uh, to the field uh, about two and a half weeks after that and then to headquarters, and we should complete our rollout by June 30th. Uh, much as uh, Bob mentioned earlier, we've followed the same protocols we've tested. Uh, I personally use the uh, Google trial, and I was very, very satisfied. There are some feature gaps. We recognize that, but we're changing from something we're all familiar with. We're moving into a new area. This is really the direction the city needs to move in, not just with email, but certainly with many of the things that we do today. I think we'll see the significant cost savings when we follow that path. Um, it was mentioned the uh, Google Sites. I've personally tested that and worked with various people throughout the department in developing sites. And the sites can be developed very easily. You will see a reduction in the staff development time. You'll see the ease in development creation of forms that can be placed on the Google Sites. It's going to really make a significant difference. The key thing that we have to address is how are we going to deploy these tools? How are we going to train the people? And training is key. It's absolutely essential to be able to train the people so they understand the differences and then understand how these tools can be used. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for offering us your perspective. Okay. Is there anybody else here for public comment on this item? Seeing and hearing no one come forward on public comment. Public comment is closed on item number two. And um, what we'll do is uh, note and file the, C uh, the CAO report um, and instruct uh, ITA and the appropriate staff based on the, recommend, uh, the instruction that was given by Council Member Zine. That's part of the record as well and the actions of this committee. Um, and also instruct ITA to provide a status update on the pilot uh, within the next 30 days as well and request the city clerk to schedule this item for the May 11, 2010 council agenda. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item number three. Item number three is a joint report from the Department of General Services, the Los Angeles Police Department, and the Los Angeles Fire Department, and a CAO report relative to cost savings and efficiencies for fleet and maintenance and the feasibility of outsourcing fleet maintenance functions.
Good afternoon. I'm Angela Sherrick with the Department of General Services. GSD, LAPD, and LAFD have formed a task force to address the issues that were noted in Council File 09600S159 and Motion Z. Specifically, each department has included a plan in the report that you have before you to address EREP vacancies. The task force has also addressed the issue of fleet consolidation by recommending that each department continue to provide maintenance to their respective fleets. However, the departments will explore specific activities which have the potential for consolidation. The task force will continue to meet and vet out whether these activities should be consolidated and the best implementation strategies. Additionally, the task force has made seven joint recommendations based on our task force meetings. I would like to briefly go through the recommendations. Recommendation one is to allow GSD, LAPD, and LAFD to continue to provide core fleet maintenance functions in each department's respective maintenance facilities using staffing that remains assigned to the respective departments. Recommendation two directs GSD, LAPD, and LAFD to fully explore and report back on potential savings, efficiencies, and impacts of the consolidation. And there's a list of areas that we'll be looking at. There's actually 11 areas that we'll be looking at for consolidation. Recommendation three directs the CAO, GSD, LAPD, and LAFD to activate 90-day authorities to hire back recent retirees. And it also directs the CAO to identify and support funding, I'm sorry, identify funding to support the 90-day contracts. Recommendation four establishes a temporary freeze on proprietary department transfers of fleet services personnel from GSD, LAPD, and LAFD. Recommendation five directs GSD, LAPD, and LAFD to oversee an outsourcing study that will review the feasibility of outsourcing specific portions of fleet maintenance. And it directs the CAO to identify funding for the outsourcing studies. Recommendation six approves the modification of language of existing contracts as described in attachment five as outlined in section 1022 of the charter of the City of Los Angeles to provide additional fleet services and to allow flexibility in how these services are to be completed. And recommendation seven directs GSD to work with EJ Ward to evaluate cost of future expansion of the fuel automation system, which will include GPS and additional vehicle data, software, hardware, and communication upgrades. So that's an overview of the report and the recommendations that are presented in the report. And I have police and fire as well as the director of fleet for GSD here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for going, giving us that briefing on the seven recommendations. What's the mechanic to vehicle equipment ratio within each department right now? My understanding that's changed quite a bit over the last two budgets and we anticipate in the future budget year it's going to change as well. So how are we doing on those ratios? In the fire department in 1997 we had a ratio of 10 to 1. We had 845 apparatus. We had 84 mechanical service technician personnel. Today at the end of EREP where we stand right now is almost 20 to 1. Part of that is due to the fact that over those years the fire department expanded its fleet, particularly in the ambulance area, so that we could have one ambulance in every fire station. We've also gained a significant number of larger apparatus through the Homeland Security grant process so that we have greater search capacity. And although some of those aren't staffed with firefighters, they're hazmat squads, USAR technical vehicles for potential terrorism or earthquake type events. So our ratios significantly changed for us. So it's gone down almost fourfold. 84 to 21, that's almost exactly fourfold. No, I'm sorry. You misunderstood the numbers. It was 10 to 1 in 97 and it's almost 20 to 1 now. Yeah, but we had how many mechanics in what, 97 you said? We had 84 mechanics. How many mechanics do we have now? We have, I'm forgetting the number, but our apparatus fleet went from 845 to 1225. So I think we have 67 mechanical personnel right now. Okay, I misunderstood. The fleet increase accounts for a large amount of that change ratio-wise. New ambulances. Okay. Thank you. 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 Th
that they, they, they enhanced their, their vehicles. Yeah, so it's even worse. Yeah. The ratio. Yes. Vartan Yegian, uh, Fleet Director of Motor Transport Division, LAPD. Historically, our uh, mechanic to vehicle ratio has been between 35 to 40, but over the years it has increased. And after the ERIP, we have basically between 55 to 60 uh, mechanic to vehicle ratio. And um, not every shop has basically 55 to 60 ratio. Some shops have a ratio of 45 to one mechanic, and some shops have 60 to 70. It depends on the type of equipment we have uh, located in each shift or shop. Thank you. Uh, Richard Colson, uh, GSD Fleet Services, uh, Director of Fleet Services. Uh, actually, uh, one of the differences between uh, fire and police is we work on a variety of equipment. So this, the uh, equipment to mechanic ratios will vary just depending upon the equipment. For example, uh, just briefly, you get like a refuse collection vehicle. Well, basically, it's eight to one. Uh, street sweepers are somewhat similar as far as ratios. As far as equipped mechanics to sedans, it's, it's very similar to what the uh, police department has. Um, basically, right now with, with EREP, uh, just for example, our heavy equipped mechanics, before we, were, we had 76 mechanics, with EREP we're losing 10, so we're going to be down 60, we're going to be down 10 mechanics, which will take us down to 65. Basically, with that, we're um, shorthanded by, with the amount of labor hours that we need on the construction equipment that we currently maintain, we're understaffed by 10 positions just in the heavy duty equipment mechanic category. Uh, and with that, what we're doing is we're util utilizing equipment mechanics in that capacity to help, uh, you know, move the work along uh, to help support our customers. Would 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 anybody venture to guess that DWP is having the same problem? No. Or is DWP benefiting from our experienced personnel that are no longer uh, working directly for the city, but now working directly for the Department of Water and Power? I, I can say for GSD. Um, Typically, they have a majority of our uh, heavy-duty equipment mechanics there. And one of the unfortunate things is uh, they have an insight to all of our top technicians, and, and, and typically they, uh, they'll pick the best of the best. One of the reasons that the one of the recommendations is that we freeze the uh, transfer is, is because of that, that reason specifically. Well, I have a long-term solution for that, no reciprocity on a pension. When they're working for the city, they have a pension. They go to Water and Power, they get a better pension. They don't have a reciprocity. If we would eliminate that, then they'd probably stay here. In other words, your police garage or your fire department garage, you're going to get more money at Water and Power with a better pension. If we were to say you don't have reciprocity with that pension, then I think we would be able to stop some of that blood that continues to flow. And I see it happening in all the departments. And if I was working with the water and power, you're getting more money, you get a better pension. We're not going to be able to compete with that pension system. But this, at least, people join the city in a mechanical capacity, and then they find the pastures greener over there. They're going to try and move over, and many of them do. And then we recruit new people, and they move over. So that the pension would be a system that would put an end to that, because most people wouldn't want to forgive that or forfeit that part. And for some that, time, that encourages them to do that. For some time now, we've been sort of a training ground for them. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that's been tenable when we've been able to backfill those vacancies that are created by the people the tritting. Mm -hmm. But now that we're not able to fill those, it's just, um, you know, emptying our ranks. Mm -hmm. It's creating a lot of problems well, for us. Talking about efficiencies, um, I'll give you an example that happened to me recently. The engine blew in my car in uh, Sherman Way and Woodman in the San Fernando Valley. And I was able to leap down to the Van Nuys garage. What were you doing in my district? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was ahead. looking for graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got to the garage, uh, and I notified the motor mark downstairs, the Van Nuys looked at it and they said, we can't fix it. They have tow trucks at Van Nuys. The bottom line is they sent a tow truck out from downtown. They sent a vehicle out from downtown to transport my car downtown to fix. So, I mean, the efficiency wasn't there. You're at a city facility, you're at a city garage, and while it was too big or too small, whatever, you're with the city council. It's a city general services vehicle versus a police vehicle. And it probably the same thing at the fire department. 
totally inefficient. So instead of the, the police garage doing something, they just said, hey, you know, it's not our ball game. Somebody else has to handle it. So to me, that's not a very efficient operation. Maybe they could have taken the tow truck from Van Nuys and transported the car down or fixed it or whatever. So all we're doing is you know, shopping back and forth. And if it's if it's a heavy duty rig, I can understand that. But on a regular vehicle, part of that, it's my territory, it's your territory. We got these block walls up. And there's really a, a total lack of cooperation. I know water and power has heavy duty equipment, so does the fire department. Police department doesn't have that much. But when it comes to heavy duty mechanics, and I've been to the fire garage, they have a ton of vehicles that are waiting to get repaired. They don't have the personnel to do it. And the fire chief I spoke with, he says, I've contacted Water and Power to get those mechanics to come over on overtime. They don't want to do it. Meanwhile, the backlog of fire equipment continues to build up where the fleet is not in operation. That's a continuing problem. Then you go down to P2 at City Hall East, and there's a number of pool vehicles, white Prius pool vehicles. I don't know how often they're used, but they're sitting down there, especially go down on a weekend. And we don't share those if they're used by other departments, or they just sit there, and then some departments don't have hardly any cars. I mean, the, the whole thing with the fleet maintenance, it's fire department has theirs, general service has theirs, police department has theirs, water power has theirs, I'm sure airport has theirs. Everybody has their own thing, yet it's the city with the city seal. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of cooperation. I'm not blaming you folks, I'm just saying in general, everybody has their own backyard with their fence around it, and nobody can penetrate it. We're trying to streamline it and make it more efficient, save some money, and have the fleet continue to flow because we're not going to be getting cars for a while. We're not getting, other than ambulances, which I, uh, in public safety, we discussed they're going to get some ambulances. Uh, that's it. There, there's no other fleet coming around. And then they've got the motorcycles that are serviced by the motorcycle mechanics, which I guess is a specialty, but the airport has motorcycle officers and the harbor has motorcycle officers. Who's servicing those? I mean, the, the, the whole thing really needs to be better connected. And if you go to one place to get fuel, every car has a shop number. I guess it gets charged back to that particular department, which I understand everybody has an allocation. But it just seems that it's, you know, if I go to Culver City, I'm not going to be able to use their mechanics. But if you're in the city of L.A., you should have maybe share some of those resources, which I don't think is done at all. Council Member, one of the things that we're looking at in the report, there are actually two recommendations um, you spoke about the pool. One of the recommendations is to actually look at pool sharing between uh, uh, police and GSD. So that's something that the task force is actually looking at. Another thing that's uh, in the report also talks about cooperative agreements between the departments. So that as, as you said, um, you're looking at a sedan. So maybe, um, maybe uh, GSD and police department can repair fire sedan so that we're, we're, we're looking at the, the, the things that you just brought up. We're, at, we're actually looking at those in the task force to be able to actually cross lines and be able to do repairs at different um, different departments because it's a city vehicle. Yeah, I think that would serve everyone's purpose, yeah. especially the people who are paying the bill, the taxpayer. Ron is Lewis, LAPD. One other thing we're talking to FIRE about is because we have a specialty in, in sedans, maybe we can help them out with that area where they have a specialty in heavy duties, and we do have a few heavy duty vehicles. Right. They can help us out in that area. So we're talking about exchanging expertise. Yeah, I mean, that cooperative effort is, goes a long way. The water and power with their, I don't think Harbor has many heavy duty equipment. I don't think the airport does, but fire department, the water and power, they have a lot of heavy duty equipment. Now, the helicopter, you folks do the helicopters also? That's correct. Fire and police, they have that same. General stuff. Services does all the helicopters for the city. Okay, what about for water and power? We yes. maintain their helicopters as well. Okay, so that's consolidated. Correct. We could use that and maybe duplicate that, make it a little more efficient. I mean, I, I could see the old way. You have a fire department mechanic for the helicopter, police department for the helicopter. At least they've consolidated for the service and the maintenance. That's basically what I'm looking at to make it more efficient for everybody. Because there's plenty of work to do out there with the, the pool of cars. They have 40-some thousand or 17,000 vehicles. I so. think that the, um, the consolidation effort there is, is a lot more fruitful for us when we're looking at vehicles that are similar across the different departments. Like we have Crown Victorias that are the same as a police exactly. car. Exactly. Um, but when you look at the more specialized equipment, our fire apparatus, the street sweepers, things like that that are in one department, 
I think that maybe the keeping the expertise there, the training for those particular things would be more advantageous for the city. Whereas like the helicopters, they may be fire, police, water and power helicopters, but helicopters really don't vary that much. They may have some adjuncts on them for their particular purpose, like we have water tanks, but it doesn't make the service requirements any different. But a diesel engine in a fire truck and a diesel engine in a water and power vehicle is a diesel engine. Correct. If you're a diesel mechanic, you're a diesel mechanic. At the rate, we got one radio shop that services, as I understand, every radio that we have in operation in the city. But when you look at M motor transport, 30% vacancy rate, I mean, that's a huge number of folks. And then what happens, it backs up the system because now you don't have the cars out there to do the job. And then next will be the black and white cars saying, you know, we can't respond to radio calls. And, and Bureau of Sanitation trucks and street services trucks. Right. We're talking about the potential, because of the mechanic situation, potential of bottlenecking a lot of other city services, whether it's police, fire, sanitation trucks, street services uh, vehicles, specialty heavy equipment, things of that nature. How are we doing right now when it comes to those matters? To you, as managers of these systems of fleets, uh, are you okay with uh, the, the the new figures and numbers of ratios and mechanics and with ERIP and DWP and all these other things that are pulling away from our ability to keep our people where they need to service these vehicles? Well, at Motor Transport Division. We feel very comfortable at 30 percent vacancy. Uh, we can handle the workload, and in fact, we have been keeping, keeping our benchmarks at the level that we promised we can. Uh, the out-of-service rate has not increased. Uh, the vehicle downtime has not increased. We have managed to uh, redeploy personnel to keep positions. We have managed to um, increase the scope of uh, supervisors and managers, and also train garage attendants to, to, to take on certain uh, work. So we're, we are able to take care of business. Uh, but you shut down your night watch. Uh, we shut down certain operations, only one night at uh, one watch at Wilshire Division. And we may have to if, if uh, we lose more people. It all depends on can we hold the 30 percent vacancy, will this increase or not? Uh, at this rate, to answer your co question, Mr. Cardenas, yes, we can maintain our uh, integrity. But if we lose more personnel, then we have to go back and redesign our uh, business model. Uh, it, all based, it, it is all based on what kind of human resources we have available. Because the vehicle uh, numbers do not reduce and the mileage that they put on these vehicles do not reduce at LAPD and the work continues. They have to fight the crime and they have to use the vehicles. So thus far we adjust to where the most critical need is. Well, what's going to happen is your vehicle fleet ages they're going to have more breakdowns. Correct, and we are asking for mo more money for parts and material, and we will maintain those vehicles as they age. Uh, we feel confident that the next year or two we can maintain the fleet as it goes. Uh, thereafter, it becomes a different issue. We're paying very close attention to vehicle utilization. We're trying to change the culture a little bit with our command officers to let them know that they have to be our partners in monitoring the utilization of our cars, not having cars, some cars that are barely used and other cars that are overused. And we're balancing that with them and making them our partner in that effort. Another thing we're doing is we, we don't have new cars coming in, so a lot of the, the mechanics that we would normally assign to retrofitting those cars, putting the light bars on, the radio stuff in there, um, they are now assigned to maintenance and repairs. So we're making adjustments based on what we have. Just in regards to uh, general services, I guess the, what, the message I've conveyed to my fleet managers, we're somewhat in a survival mode uh, right now. And uh, basically what we've already done, as you've seen in the report in our um, budget reduction package, we're already uh, calculating another 2,000 vehicle fleet reduction. We've already, uh, uh, and again, the whole intent behind that was to bring the fleet, the size of the fleet down to where it's more manageable for us with the staffing that we currently have, with uh, the losses we're going to take in the equipment mechanic and heavy and heavy duty equipment mechanic uh, positions. Uh, we're also looking at uh, right sizing the fleet as far as the best practice. This was a fleet utilization study that we're working on right now uh, for all the fleet services to be done in different phases for on road equipment and even construction equipment, which is going to help us in our heavy duty equipment mechanic uh, capacity. 
Um, we've all, as you guys have probably already seen in the report, we've already consolidated ships. We've uh, closed shops already. We're, we're finding that we're um, uh, decentralizing now uh, our resources now because of the, the lack of staffing that we currently have. Um, and, and of course, from that, it's just the cooperative effort. I, I work with an incredible group of individuals within fleet services, uh, anywhere from deploying staff to different shops, wherever the fires are. The guys are going out and work on equipment, uh, to moving equipment around to different shops, whatever we can do to help each other out. Uh, what, what Council Member Zine is talking about a, on a collaborative effort, what all of us, fleet services, is doing just internally within all of our shops, depending going across area lines or whatever it takes just to get the equipment out working very closely with our customers or deciding what the priorities are. Has it affected vehicle downtime? Yes, it has. Uh, but again, uh, thanks to our customers for being uh, patient, understanding. And again, whatever it takes, we say what's important today. And whether it's street services, sanitation, whoever it is, recreation and parks, they say I need this today. And that's what we work on and get out for them. Well, I know what happened in San Francisco is when we had these massive fires and the mutual aid, they didn't send any fire equipment because what they had need to remain in San Francisco because their fleet was so depleted because no one was servicing them mm -hmm. and they did not participate in mutual aid. We don't need that Correct. down here where we can't participate in mutual aid because we don't have enough vehicles to go respond to the situation. Fine. Um, I hate to be the odd man out, but I would, I would say the general feeling is that we do not really have enough to get by. Um, we have put together some some solutions to try and work through that which are in the recommendations to look at ways of augmenting our labor hours but um, you know I my concern is that our message isn't really being heard or it's not really being uh, understood clearly enough when I see in the uh, blue book that we're uh, potentially going to lose an equipment mechanic uh, because it's a resolution authority and by the blanket policy they're removing that um, unlike some of the other departments, fire department has um, not reduced our service level at all. We're going on every 911 call just like we had before. We haven't changed our response model, which is a potential to reduce some of the, the mileage that the vehicles in the fleet get, but we haven't done that yet. Um, our support requirements for the fleet are unchanged. Um, our existing vacancies, the, the cut in this, in this uh, coming budget year of that one equipment mechanic and the potential for continued attrition to water and power and other proprietaries makes our future ability to support our fleet questionable. And that's why in our recommendations uh, we put in the, uh, the recommendation that we, not, that we put a freeze on that attrition to water and power and the other proprietaries. Um, outsourcing is a good solution in a lot of cases and it will be for us in some of the work that we do. But in looking at our shop rate and our actual cost of providing the service we do, we're, we work out about a $75 uh, labor rate for our shop. We can't find anything on the outside that's, that even comes close to that. We think that the city gets good bang for its buck from the mechanics in all of the departments, and we would encourage you to, to really uh, think twice about the, the outsourcing. We're not sending this overseas to Korea or somewhere where the labor rates are lower. We're sending it right outside our door uh, in Southern California where shop rates are not cheap. Um, but based on uh, my discussions with the CAO and with their input, um, I'm going to recommend to my fire chief that we submit a supplementary budget request to augment our funding. We're going to need that funding for one thing or another. We're either going to need more people or we're going to need money to do outsourcing we're going to need money to secure longer warranties for our vehicles with our aging fleet, or we're going to need money to augment our fleet with newer vehicles. Something's got to get somewhere. I, I will tell you, I've been to the yard on Pasadena 19 when they've got paramedic units that are sitting there and fire trucks that are sitting there waiting to get serviced, collecting dust because there's no one to do any service on them. So it's, I mean, it gets to the point where penny wise and dollar foolish, but clearly yep. you only have so many mechanics that are there. And Tony... Tony's big, but he doesn't do the work of two mechanics. No, he came down to council because he was concerned about it. He, yeah. he loves working for the fire department. He's, what, seven feet or eight feet tall, <laughs> the nicest man. And he came down and said, you know, we really need some help. So I've been there a couple times to see what you folks are going through. Well, last clearly you need to have the help there. Last week, uh, Council Member LeBonge came down and uh, we gave him a presentation and Tony uh, gave him a uh, walk through the shop and showed him where our shortages were and what our concerns were. Yeah, they're huge, yeah. definitely. Council Member, 
also as part of the report we were looking at ninety day contracts and and we're also looking at expanding some of the contracts that we already have in ninety day contracts to actually hire back some of our erip people who left on erip and we're also looking at expanding the labor components and some of the contracts that we already have in place so as chief mccarty said one of the things that we'd like to do is put together some supplemental budget request to bring those back to this committee so that you could take a look at those because those are things that we would like to look at going forward to help shore up the staffs going forward without the overhead okay very good thank you um public comment we do have a public comment card um uh julie butcher who's that Yep. For each one of the departments, could you get us those supplemental budget reports back in the next 30 to 60 days? Anybody needing longer than that? Well, actually, do you prefer 10 days? Just kidding. Actually, Council Member, uh, Jason with the CS office, if the uh, supplemental budget request is to be part of the 1011 budget, uh, we're going through the ad hoc process right now, and we'll be going through budget memos starting tomorrow. So if there are any budgetary consideration that should be considered for the coming budget, they really need to submit it within a day or two. Okay. Because well, obviously, if you have something on hand and ready, submit it so that it can go through the current budget process. However, uh, that's why we call them supplemental. You're welcome to bring them to the policy committee, and then we will take them through the process from there. Thank you. I suspect that's what they meant they were going to do. Not speaking for... Uh the fleet managers. Um, Julie Butcher representing SEIU 721. We represent all of the mechanics in all of these departments. Um, these guys do a really good job with really tough circumstances. Um, frankly, when you have a mechanic fixing a fire truck, we believe that's as in, in, important to public safety as the person that drives it. Um, when a police vehicle is in a high-speed chase, there is a 76, stop me if I have this number wrong, point um, inspection that's done after every single high-speed chase. Now, the mechanics would like the police officers to learn to open police cars without using their feet. We think that would be an efficiency. Um, but absent that, um, this work is critical. That was a joke. I'm sorry. That's um, how you, kick, you learn how to kick doors that way. Well, <laughs> when it's an emergency, that's one thing. But, you know, not every time you open the door. Um, <laughs> These are public workers doing critical public work. We believe it's a critical that it be done by public workers. So when we hear schemes being bantied around about privatization of this work, we're gonna, you're going to have a fight from us, a big fight from us. When you're talking about furloughing mechanics in the fire department, in the police department, and in general services, while the folks that work, the vehicles are not furloughed, the cr criminals are not furloughed. So you're already short on mechanics. A couple of things. One, we would absolutely support the notion of doing more work together. The helicopter shop is a model. It's a model of efficiency and of operation that absolutely works. It's magical. And we do the mechanical work for all of the helicopters in all of the city departments. There's a, an opportunity to maximize our, our, our efficiency. Um, I don't think that means consolidating. I think that means sharing the opportunity. Um, we will oppose efforts to privatize this work, particularly when we're talking about there is a layoff proposed of a fire department mechanic. Now, let me help you understand this. The city doesn't hire fire department mechanics. They don't hire somebody that can work on a fire truck. The city hires a mechanic. That mechanic applies for a job as a mechanic and based on their mechanical ability gets hired by the Continue. city. Go ahead. And that is without regard to department. So a mechanic applies for the city and magically water and power calls first. It's the same list, it's the same test, it's the same job. And so we would, as the union that represents the lower paid mechanics that work on your critical pieces of equipment, we would oppose an attempt to thwart their promotional opportunities. Those are promotional opportunities the city has defined because they pay more money. They come off the same list, have the same requirements. The folks that work on trash trucks, big as they are, hydraulic driven as they are, those are equipment mechanics, but those are not heavy duty equipment mechanics. We would like a couple of things. One, we would like a, a specific um, instruction about furloughing mechanics when you don't have enough. 
Um, we would like to be part of this working group. We have, the workers have a tremendous amount to offer to this opportunity and would really like to be part of the conversation. There are labor management efforts in all of these shops. Um, these are really, when we need advice on anything from economics or anything, we find a mechanic. They tend to be some of the smartest workers. Um, you know that they could figure this out. And we want to, the workers want to be involved in this. Um, bringing back people on 90 day contracts makes absolute sense except when you're talking about furloughing and laying off those same workers. And in that circumstance, we will, you will have a fight from, the, from this union. Um, we would oppose privatization. It doesn't make any sense. Plus, you have an agreement with us that this work will not be contracted out. You can't find it cheaper. You certainly can't find it at a higher quality for less. Um, there's opportunities to figure this out. We have to figure out how to train new mechanics. And that's not by hiring new ones. That's by training folks that already work for you. There are, there are thousands of people that are in danger of being of losing their job. There have got to be 50 of them that have some mechanical ability that we can teach how to do this work. General services has Actually, many of these departments have really figured out how to move people from garage attendants to be journey level mechanics who already work for you all. Um, we believe that this work, the opportunity exists within the workforce. We'd like to work with you. Um, we'd like that not to be in the context of figuring out how we contract out this work, because that's not where you're going to get the best um, bang for this long term buck. Um, and then I want to thank you, uh, uh, Council Member, for. Um, uh, sending out Eduardo. Um, he's been wonderful and really helpful and now knows more about the mechanical operations of the city than any of us. Uh, Hold on a second. I told, I, told, I told him not to leave the office. He promised me that he was going to be sitting by, behind his desk this whole time and he's been out and about. It was okay, a different Eduardo you. Hewitt. Sorry, thank I didn't you. see him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Only two bucks. Well, I, 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 you, you touched on a lot of things, Julie, but one thing that I think is very important, I think that some people are of the school that policymakers should not get their hands dirty, that policymakers and their staff shouldn't go out there and actually kick the tires or what have you. But I, I disagree with that. I think that as policymakers and as the CAO and the CLA and people who recommend policy at various levels, it's important that we go ahead and listen as much as we speak sometimes and that we actually look rather than just read it in a book. So thank you for, for pointing that out. And also, as Tom LeBond, it was mentioned that he, he went out to a particular facility and, and got a little educated on something. And it seems like Dennis zine has been visiting a few places as well. I just want to say that that definitely always needs to be part of the process, and we need to be mindful of that. Because a lot of times what looks good on paper might not make sense when you actually see it in person. So, um, and that's one of the reasons why we have a policy process like this, where we have people come up and testify, where we get an opportunity to ask questions and to actually, you know, read between the lines and find out more than just as what is on paper. So, I think it's really important for everybody to, everybody to understand this this thing about filling out a public comment card is not a game. It's not just to satisfy the Constitution or the Charter or what have you. It is, in fact, a portion of and a very critical, important part about policy making. Uh, and I really feel bad for elected officials who are not part of policy making bodies because, unfortunately, it's a lot harder to stay closer to the issues when you are uh, considered to be just someone who implements and not someone who actually uh, makes policy and makes these kinds of changes. So I think today was a, a tremendous demonstration of that. So with that, um, is anybody else here for public comment on item three? Seeing no one else come forward, public comment on item three is now closed. Uh, with that, what we'll do is we'll note and file the CAO report and approve the GSD report. There were no other recommendations, right? Okay. Okay. So with that, that'll be the action of the committee. Thank you all very much. In addition to that, um, you also touched on something, Julie. You reminded me and I told my staff earlier, I've had this idea ever since I got to the council, and I think I, Mr. Zion will probably want to second it when I introduce it. I'm going to introduce a motion that's going to require of our propri proprietary departments that they adhere to an extrapolation method where they will actually compensate the city every time they take someone who has X amount of experience or, or more or has a specialty um, because it's not funny, it's not cute, it's actually dangerous when we allow ourselves and I respect the fact, Julie, it is a promotion, yet at the same time, it's not right that we should have a void 
over here on one side of the family and then all of a sudden somebody gets promoted and rightfully so they deserve that opportunity they're skilled etc but yet over here we don't have the resources to retool or retrain or promote somebody else into that void and but if these proprietaries are able to afford themselves the opportunity to pay people more to give them more compensation etc then they're going to have to start calculating either they're going to train them themselves or if they're going to go around stealing them from the rest of the city their their brother or sister uh in the same household the same city family but the thing is they need to be ready to compensate and they should be happy to do it because if they're recognizing that person to be that skilled and that important to them and they're willing to make them that such a wonderful offer then that the, the city should be compensated for so that not not to be compensated for somebody's skill but to be able to be compensated so that we can actually backfill that position and continue to stay healthy as a whole we already have that process with the police department where an officer leaves less than five years there's a sliding scale they must repay the training cost so the most outrageous was also graduated on a friday and monday he was working for another police department so the taxpayers pay for that training he graduates and then Monday he reports to another department uh, that's what tipped it to uh, bring this about where they have to repay the training cost uh, over a five-year period of time if they leave less than five years which is basically what you're saying which I think is a good opportunity to uh, maintain some stability and that makes it fair and equitable it's not a deterrent it's just a fact the fact of doing business and and as a matter of fact it, it, it begs the question and I'll be done Mr. Zine um, my brother, who was a, a, a public works commissioner for a couple years, he's an engineer, he's back in the private sector. He told me a story that we kind of laughed about it when he told me, but something that we shook our heads and say it's pretty pathetic. They were in an orientation meeting congratulating new employees of the city. And then on the person's first day, on these people's first day, they said, does anybody have any questions? And then somebody on their first day raised their hand, and in their innocence and ignorance, they said, how soon can I transfer to the Department of Water and Power? This is on the person's first day. Talk about dedicated to the city. Uh, in my opinion, a bit of a selfish thing to say on your first day of work. I would be thinking about how happy I am to be part of the city family, got bennies and, you know, got a nice pay and all those things. But the thing on that person's mind is, how soon can I transfer to the Department of Water and Power? And that was on that person's first day. So it just exacerbates the reality that we have a little bit of a problem. We have a little bit of a problem here. So with that, we open it up for general public comment. Is anybody here for general public comment? Seeing and hearing no one come forward for general public comment to this committee. General public comment is now closed. This committee is now adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Zine.